Okay, thank you. <clears throat> My topic is excited state symmetry breaking, the way toward a symmetrical photochemistry. And I will tell you <clears throat> about the specifics of the photophysical behavior of quadrupolar molecules. So what are the quadrupolar molecules? The quadrupolar molecules are those which uh, constitute uh, donor and acceptor, electron donor and electron acceptor moieties, which are arranged in this kind of molecular architecture, so GAD or of AGA types. And it has been known that such molecules, they possess normally a uh, very high two-photon absorption cross-sections. And two-photon absorption is a process during which the molecule simultaneously absorbs two photons to jump into the electronic excited state. And <clears throat> contrary to normal one-photon process, which happens when you jump here from here to here just by one photon, it has multiple advantages. The most important advantage is, of course, its high spatial resolution, because if one photon process occurs along the whole optical path of the laser beam, the two photon process happens only in the focal point of the laser beam. So here is a tiny dot that shows the fluorescence of the molecules in the excited state. So it's really a very confined process. And this can benefit uh, many applications. So for example, fluorescence microscopy, optical data storage, or for example, two photon induced microfabrication and photopolymerization. So for example, this micrometer scale binding has been made by this two-photon photopolymerization, and these molecules are used as two-photon photoinitiators for this process. And uh, <coughs> these molecules, so they normally, so they constitute of these two branches, each branch has a significant dipole moment, because you have donor and acceptor moieties, but due to the symmetrical arrangement of the two branches, the whole molecule is weakly polar or generally apolar. So these molecules look symmetric, and indeed they are, but only in the electronic ground state. So as evidenced by their static absorption spectra, you see no solvent dependence. And this is exactly what you expect from uh, this kind of molecule, which uh, comprises two symmetrical branches, and which is uh, generally apolar. But their fluorescence spectra show dramatic solvent dependence. And this is not something that you would expect from a molecule like this, which uh, when you excite should be associated with a large change of quadrupolar moment. Rather, the fluorescence, so which means in the excited state, it looks rather something like this. So the molecule which uh, <coughs> constitutes only just of one arm. So it looks like the whole thing in the excited state, uh, it behaves like this. So like the whole second arm doesn't, is not active. And there was a, a whole theoretical concept called symmetry breaking that people tried to explain that somehow in the excited state, the thing from this turns into something like this. But it wasn't clear how it happens. And what we see here is a static spectrum. So it's a result of everything that happens in the excited state. And of course, we want to time resolve this process. So we want to see how exactly and what exactly happens in the excited state. And to do this, we <coughs> use the time resolved spectroscopy. So the standard way to do it is to use, for example, electronic transient absorption, where you use two laser pulses. The first laser pulse arrives to your molecule to provide it into the excited state. And the second laser pulse arrives sometime later that you can regulate this time, and it probes whatever uh, happens with your molecule in the excited state. So like this, you can do it at multiple times, and you can reconstruct whatever happens uh, in your excited state. And so here is the result of the strains in absorption. So on this axis, you have the wavelengths of the probing light, and here you have time. So the red color corresponds to positive signal, which means the excited state absorption. The blue color corresponds to the depletion of the ground state. And also, you can have some fluorescence. <clears throat> And this uh, lower panel just shows the cut along one picosecond, so it's a more conventional uh, way how to present this spectrum. But as we can see, in non-polar cyclohexane and in highly polar DMSO, there are not so much differences. So the spectra are pretty much the same, and uh, the only difference <coughs> is that molecule is shorter in the DMSO contrary to cyclohexane, and you see some stimulated emission in cyclohexane. But there is no symmetry breaking, you don't see anything. And people who are trying to catch the symmetry breaking, and we as well, we try to use this electronic, fluores uh, electronic spectroscopy or time resolved fluorescence, and obviously it doesn't work. So what we offer is to use the time resolved infrared, 
which is still a transient absorption. So you still use the first pulse to promote your molecule in the excited state, but your second pulse now is in the mid infrared. So like this, you can actually <coughs> uh, obtain some structural information from your excited state, still with the femtosecond time resolution. And now <coughs> this quadrupolar molecule, which is depicted here, uh, it shows the dramatic solvent dependence in the infrared. So here we probed CC triple bonds, which are excellent local vibrational markers, very well separated from the rest of the molecule spectrally and spatially. And we see that it <coughs> this molecule in non-polar cyclohexane, it demonstrates a single excited state absorption band, which is very intense, which dominates the spectrum. It's located at 2018 inverse centimeters and essentially stays there until the whole the molecule returns to the ground state. So this band, we call this band alpha, and it is consistent with the symmetric quadrupolar excited state, where our excitation is shared symmetrically among the two branches. So the electronic density on two triple bonds is the same, and we see a single arm, which corresponds to the anti-symmetric stretching of these uh, two bonds. So this is consistent with the quadrupolar state, which we call state Q. So everything is clear. But when we move to <coughs> weakly polar chloroform, we see the picture is different. We see already that we have at the beginning one band, but at later times we see the second band rising and then the both bands decay synchronously with the lifetime corresponding to the lifetime of this uh, molecule in this solvent. So the presence of two excited state absorption bands is an ambiguous indication of symmetry breaking and it shows that the electronic density is no longer the same on two branches, so you have more on one branch and less on the other. And the dynamics in the solvent could be reproduced going from state Q, characterized by band here, to some other state that we call state I, intermediate state, which character is characterized by two bands, band alpha and this new band beta. When you go to highly poor DMSO, the situation is even more complicated. So you still have these dynamics going from state Q to state I, characterized by two bands, but then it's not end. <coughs> At the end, everything goes to a new band, which is located in between the bands alpha and beta, which we call uh, band gamma, which is located at 2,113 inverse centimeters. So what is this state? What does this uh, band gamma represent? So to answer this question, we did the experiments with a dipolar counterpart of our molecule, which consists just of one arm. So it's a push-pull analog of our molecule, which just, let's say, removes the second arm. And this molecule shows a single feature in all the solvents that we started. And it's always excited state absorption band at 2130 inverse centimeters. So we know that for our quadrupolar molecule, in highly poor solvents, it ends in the state which is analogous to the state of this molecule. So which means it's a purely dipolar state where the whole excitation is trapped on one arm. <coughs> And the dynamics of this process of going from Q to I, and then going from I to D in highly poor solvents, corresponds to salvation dynamics. And it's solvent polarity which determines how far the process will go, if it will stay here, or if it go here, like in weakly poor solvents, or like in DMA, so it goes further. And if you uh, <coughs> play with polarity, you can find the solvent where the, these two states are close in energy, so they can equilibrate, and you see the synchronous decay of this state. So in our case it was THF, you see a synchronous decay of all three bands. <clears throat> so general symmetry breaking scheme can be summarized as follows. So we have our quadrupolar molecule, which is solvated in the solvent. If cited to the uh, quadrupolar excited state where the excitation is symmetrically shared between the two branches, and then the solvent reaction field determines what happens with the molecule. If the solvent reaction field is low, like what is the case in the non-poor solvents in cyclohexanes, and it just stays there and goes down to the ground state. But as two arms are never uh, solvated symmetrically, so the solvent arrangement around the two arms is never the same, the solvent reaction field, so the solvent fluctuations and this initial asymmetry of solvent distribution, it drives this asymmetry, so when the solvent reaction field is higher, like in, high, in uh, weakly poor solvents, you drive this sort of asymmetrization, so you have more ex uh, excitation on one arm and less on the other. And in highly poor solvents, where solvent reaction field is high, you have enough driving force to localize the whole excitation on one arm after the diffusive solvation takes place. So this is a general picture, and uh, it's the general solvent interactions, 
which determines this process. Now let's take a look at this molecule, which is now of ADA type, and here we will monitor CN triple bond, which is again an excellent uh, local vibrational marker, but now it's an acceptor. So the, <clears throat> essentially the picture is the same in this quadrupolar molecule. We see similar behavior in a pore solvents. We see a single excited state absorption band in pore solvents. We see the two. The difference here is that the interaction between these two arms, so the interbranch coupling, is higher, so we can never, in fact, localize excitation entirely on one arm. So it's always this intermediate state where you have some excitation here and less here. However, it doesn't mean that asymmetry is not proportional to polarity anymore. In this case, asymmetry can be expressed as a splitting between these two bands. So the higher the polarity, the higher the splitting between these two bands, and the, in fact the bandwidth is also rising. The catch here is that here we monitor the acceptor, so the more charge the acceptor accumulates, so the more excitation is on this arm, the more this band will be downshifted, and the less excitation is on this arm, the more this band will be upshifted. So that is why the higher the polarity, the more the asymmetry and the more there is the splitting. So, <coughs> We did also this experiment, respectively, of viscosity. is always a single band. So it points out that viscosity doesn't play a significant role. So these uh, geometrical fluctuations or intramolecular modes, they don't drive this process. This is another confirmation that it's a solvent which drives this process. And as I said, the dynamics of this process is a solvation dynamics. So now let's take a step further. Before we were talking only about general interactions. Now let's take a look what if we had specific interactions, namely hydrogen bonding. So in product solvents, like for example methanol and trifluoroethanol, <coughs> we see the symmet initial symmetry breaking, but then something else takes part on longer time scales. So it takes longer on, uh, from a few picoseconds to tens of picoseconds, you see further splitting of this band. So this band downshift, this band upshift. And the higher the proticity, the higher the hydrogen bonding donating ability of the solvent, the more this is pronounced. And at a certain point, when hydrogen bonding donating ability is quantified by parameter alpha of Kamlet Taft scale, when it gets too high, namely above 1.3, you see that there is something else happening. So these two bands are shifting in different directions, but there is then another band forming which has a distinct spectral position and uh, distinct lifetime. So this happens only in those enormous superproject solvents like hexafluoroisopropanol and norafluorotributanol, which have enormous hydrogen bonding donation ability. <coughs> so <coughs> what happens here? With the general interactions with the solvent, we modulate the symmetry breaking. So we modulate the amount of excitation on different arms. So we have more excitation on one arm, less excitation on the other arm. But here, as we have nitrile groups, which are hydrogen bond acceptors, as soon as we have more excitation on one arm, this group becomes more susceptible to hydrogen bonding, and hence we have a strengthening of hydrogen bonding on one side, but the other side, which loses excitation, it becomes less basic, essentially less susceptible to hydrogen bonding, so the molecule experience weakening of hydrogen bonding on this side, and this is what we see experimentally, the shift of these two bands due to uh, strengthening of hydrogen bonding and weakening of hydrogen bonding on different sides of the molecule. Then what is this new band in highly protic solvents? Well, in fact, when this uh, hydrogen bonding donating ability becomes so high, then this strengthening on one side leads to such high strengthening that essentially you form a <coughs> stoichiometric tight complex of your molecule with the solvent. And this is still, I, rem I, I remind you, this is still in the excited state. So we have a tight complex with the solvent, but only on one side, and the other side, essentially, it, the hydrogen bonding weakens so much that essentially it does not experience any hydrogen bonding. So we have a formation of new species in the excited state, which is a, this tight complex. And uh, this is uh, <coughs> quite spectacular, because normally hydrogen bonds are dynamical constructs, which form and break very quickly, it takes femtoseconds, picoseconds, and here we have something that uh, stacks to our molecule and stays there for hundreds of picoseconds. <coughs> and here we see that in this, uh, <coughs> this uh, tight complex is indeed very spectacular <coughs> because the lifetime is completely different in this uh, super product solvent. So normally, the dependence uh, of the lifetime on polarity is very weak, but for these highly protic solvents, when we have this tight complex formation, there is obviously something new 
that uh, determines the lifetime. So now generally the symmetry breaking scheme can be summarized as follows. So again, we excite our quadrupolar molecule to the quadrupolar excited state, which is symmetrical, and it stays there in a poor solid. Then the solvation, so first the inertial solvation, where there is not much motion of the solvent around your molecule, it drives this asymmetrization, so you have more excitation on one arm, less on the other, and then diffusive solvation enhances it even further, so this takes you pick a few picoseconds. This is where the story ends for a product solvents. In product solvents, so this uh, more excitation on one arm drives strengthening of hydrogen bond on one side, weakening on the other, and if your alpha parameter is high enough, you can have the formation of the complex on one side and essentially no hydrogen bonding on the other side. Now, so the take home message is that solvent polarity and dynamics determine symmetry breaking. The hydrogen bond interactions can amplify the effect significantly and they can lead to asymmetrical photochemistry. But now let's still take a look what is happening <coughs> here because <coughs> it looks like we switch on something new when we form this uh, asymmetric excited complex because the lifetime is going down very dramatically. And uh, this also has been known that many charge transfer molecules, when you put them in protic solvents, their lifetime is decreased drastically. It's known for many chromophores. And uh, in fact, uh, to solve this question, so what is happening, we propose a new approach in transient infrared, which is consistent of, visible, of uh, solid pump solvent probe transient infrared. So what we do here, we still pump with a visible pulse our molecule, but now we probe with IR light not the molecule itself, but the solvent molecule around. And what is interesting is, is this is a pump probe experiment, we don't probe the, just all the solvent molecules. We will selectively see only those solvent molecules which are coupled somehow, which feel the presence of our chromophore. So only those molecules directly interacting and feeling our chromophore. So in this case, we pump our chromophore and we will probe this OH stretch of the hexafluoroisopropanol where we see this dramatic decrease of a, of a, of a lifetime <coughs> by a factor of more than 10. And what we see here, we were able to see that the molecules, the solvent molecules bound to our chromophore give a strong response see, um, since a very, very early time, which points to a strong coupling between our solvent molecule and uh, between the solvent molecule and our molecule, then we see this H bond strengthening in time, which is manifested as a shift of this band, and at late time we see this characteristic spectrum, which is which coincides with the thermal difference spectrum, and which shows that the whole excitation eventually ends up as a heat in the solvent. From this, and uh, <clears throat> I don't have to too much time to go into the details, but we were able to extract the molecular picture of what happens on molecular levels that can explain this hydrogen bond induced non-radiative deactivation, what we call H-bind mechanism, that first you excite the molecule and uh, in the inner shell, so those two solvent molecules which directly attach to where hydrogen bonding to our nitrile groups, <coughs> essentially then you see as a first time spectrum. And then eventually, as time goes by, you see the H bond from uh, H bond strengthen on one side, H bond losing on the other side. So the excitation spreads to the outer shell, so to those molecules which are directly H bonded to the inner shell molecules. And at the end, our chromophore is already in the ground state, maybe a few hundred picosecond later, but the solvent around still feels the heat which dissipated from the molecule, and uh, you see it as a characteristic solvent effect. So with this I want to finish, and uh, I want to thank our entire Eric Quote research group, uh, the teams of organic chemists who made the molecules, and uh, our funding sources, and last but not least, uh, you for your attention. Much longer excited states, you mean uh, many hundreds of nanoseconds or? Microseconds? I don't know. So for two photonic excitation, I guess the longer the excited state lives, the better chance you'll have catching another photon, right? 
No, for the two-fold absorption, it doesn't matter, actually, because you start anyway in the ground state. So, and then this, because the two-fold absorption is a simultaneous process. So it's not that you first absorb the first photon and then while you're already moving side state, you absorb the second. No, it doesn't work like this. You, you absorb simultaneously two photons. So it, uh, it takes like, like normal absorption process less than a few femtoseconds. So what matters here is rather this arrangement, uh, so different donor, etc. So the higher the charge transfer between different D to A, the higher the absorption cross-sections. But the excited state lifetime doesn't matter because everything happens after this. First you have to get into the excited state, and to form absorption process is just the way how you get there. Maybe I missed it, but I didn't understand why the electronic transit absorption is insensitive to the asymmetry. <coughs> well, here, first, uh, we can start with this just with an empirical fact that for many quadrupolar molecules that we've seen, you do the experiment and you don't see essentially differences between different solids. Then you do the experiment for one arm, which essentially consists just a dipole counterpart, and essentially spectral signatures are the same. So I can actually, I have, I have, oh. So for example, this is train, electronic transient absorption for this molecule we showed at the beginning in eight different solids, from non-polar, weakly polar, to highly polar. And essentially the whole difference is that the lifetime gets shorter due to the energy gap law. And uh, of course, here is to see some stimulated emission, and then it shifts to the near infrared. This is a very sensitive uh, molecule. But essentially, other than that, you don't see anything happening, so you cannot see that the symmetry breaking takes place. Now, if you go to one arm, you see essentially spectrum is very similar to this one. So at the end, spectral features of one arm, two arm are are not different, and somehow it's not surprising because essentially it's your entire chromophore which, de which determines this uh, spectral signature and transient absorption. But in the infrared, we are able to achieve the submolecular resolution, so we can actually probe the location. So, for example, with triple bond, it was in the middle, it was pi rich, so we can see uh, what, what is that specific location, how electron density is distributed in one arm or on the other. With transient absorption, we just probe the whole thing, the whole globe, so the whole chromophore. 